As our beloved members, I sure know, you all know Dr. Sarah Hume, and we're very fortunate that she's been the museum's curator for the past decade. Some of my favorite exhibitions that she's curated include Culture Counterculture, Fashions of the 60s and 70s, um, as well as the very dynamic stitched exhibition that is on view now. Sarah has a PhD in Modern European History from the University of Chicago, an MA in Museum Studies, Costume and Textiles from FIT, and a BA in Art from Yale. She is currently completing a book on regional dress practices in Alsace that will be published by Bloomsbury in 2022. Sarah, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much for the um, for the introduction. Um, does everybody see me or I'm still seeing Sarah? How does that work? Okay, so um, I will start right in on what's new recent acquisitions. So this is the latest um, exhibition here at, um, at the museum. And we have, um, and it, it is, um, it came about as we sort of re reconfigured our schedule um, owing to the, um, the pandemic and we sort of, we switched the textures exhibition to next fall. So we had to put something in, in its place. So we really wanted to showcase something that was from our collection, a way to highlight what we have um, for logistics, um, but also because, you know, we have such an amazing collection that it's a great opportunity to showcase what we have. Um, and so it's it's pieces that have come into the collection in the past um, ten years, um, and it really it, and so I really want to talk about sort of the, some of the stories that pieces come to the museum with some of the sort of relationships that 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 clothing expresses with people and wearers and owners and um, and that sort of emotional attachment people have with their clothes, um, but also. Um, about our sort of collecting um, priorities and the way we think about things and how they come into the collection. So um, a lot of these, although not all of them, are pieces that I took uh, myself. So people, you know, come from the community and offer us things. Um, and these are the pieces um, that we said yes to over the years. Um, and so the exhibition um, begins with a number of really bold pieces that are all um, they're basically black dresses. Um, and the first piece, one of the first pieces is this black satin tea gown um, that comes with, it has a um, Obo Marche label from the Paris department store um, and it's from the 1890s. And it's actually the only piece in the exhibition which is from the 19th century. Um, we are really renowned for our collection of historic costumes, um, but very few of the pieces that come into our collection at this point are from the 19th century or before. Um, and this is A, because um, we mostly take gifts from the community and people don't just have these in their closet, although evidently some people do. Um, and also, um, um, it, it, we also have a, a lot of, of pieces in our collection from that era. So that's not really the direction that we're going with a lot of our um, ex things except. But this dress is really exceptional. Um, first, it's in amazing condition. Um, the satin is is like in perfect condition almost. Um, and then there's there's a little bit on the under part of it. It's very, has this very complicated understructure to it. It looks very loose fitting, but it's actually very fitted underneath. And part of the sort of the understructure of it, it was a little bit ripped that needed a little bit of repair. But other than that, it's in great condition, which is exceptional for something from this period because um, black textiles in particular from this era tended to be treated with chemicals that ate away at them over time. And so they tend to fall apart um, as soon as if you look at them funny. So this one is really remarkable. Um, and it's this black satin for most of the dress. Um, and then it has this velvet, black velvet collar that's um, edged with embroidery and then jet beads. So this piece is really, and it has these sort of, these sort of really unique um, pleats down the center front. So the whole center front um, falls in these straight pleats. And then it has this beautiful velvet belt in the back. 
Um, so the back is really quite stunning. And the way it's positioned in the gallery, when you guys come and see it in the gallery, you can see, um, you can sort of see it from most angles because of the way it's positioned on the platform. And so you have the chance to get a peek at the back as well as the front. And then the, um, and that dress is partnered with a couple of other pieces, which are also black and um, sort of evening wear, and including this stunning Oscar de la Renta dress, um, which was donated to us from um, Savannah Clark, who is, um, some of you may remember about 12 years ago to 11 years ago, when I first started here, we did an exhibition of, of her hats, of Mrs. Clark's hats. Um, it was um, that she never leaves the house without her hat. And they were all um, all hats from her collection. And she also has stunning um, couture and um, very high-end designer dresses um, that she's given to us over the years. She's an extremely generous donor to us. And um, this piece is one of the stunning pieces um, from her collection. It has, it's sort of, um, Oscar de la Renta, it's actually from the eight, from the eighties. It looks like it's even more recent than that, but, um, it's this classic look, um, and it has all this ribbon work. Um, the ribbon is looped around and stitched onto this sort of lace ground and sequined. It's really a stunning piece and it, um, unfortunately black doesn't photograph very well. Um, so you really can't see how stunning it is in, in um, until you come and see it in person. Um, and then another. Um, another aspect of our collection, so I mentioned that we don't have that many um, historic pieces that we've collected in the past, but we are concentrating on collecting sort of contemporary design. And um, Alexander McQueen is one of the designers that we very much um, would love to build a great collection of Alexander McQueen dresses. They unfortunately don't come in the door every day, but this piece did come to us from Helen Borowitz, who was um, a very dedicated um, sort of donor to us over the years, who was a collector of historic garments as well as contemporary fashion, um, had a really brilliant collection. And this piece is actually really interesting. Um, it's from Alexander McQueen's um, fall winter 98 collection, which was called Joan. And um, it has a lot of has a lot of sort of fire and a lot of references to Joan of Arc, which was kind of the, the theme, but it also had the pictures, this sort of digital image of these three girls. And for some reason, the story that circulates about this story, about this, about this image, is that it's a picture of the Romanoff children. And this, this sort of story reappeared, it was in, in like looking up looking up this 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 dress um, it's it appears in vogue and all over you know all over the internet and I don't know where that the that story came from this is one of the big mysteries that we've been discussing around here, around the museum because this story I actually found the original image which you can see on the right which is this daguerreotype portrait of these three girls um, and it was a portrait taken by the photographer Carl Gustav Ohm. And um, there is the image for you. It's from 1845, which is, um, which is 60 years before the Romanov children. So um, it has nothing to do with the Romanov children. So there's this wonderful image and there's this delightful story and the two things don't seem to go together. So um, we did sort of, um, I did, you know, through, through sleuthing, I, un I, the reason why I actually looked it up too, because I, I knew that the image looked like it was from the 1840s or 50s and the Romanovs are associated, I mean, the Romanov children's like Anastasia is associated with um, the Bolshevik revolution, which was in 1917. Um, so clearly these could not be from the same, um, could not be images of the same people. Um, so we did some digging and found this and it only sort of invited more questions. Where did the Romanov story come from? Why is that associated with it? but we do not know for the time being, but we do have this, the piece, oops, yes, I moved ahead. Um, but the piece is really interesting because it is the sequin, it's covered all over with sequins and then is digitally printed over the sequins. Um, so it has this really crazy texture and it sort of moves with you when you look at it. It's really beautifully done. And it's a really great example for the students of design at the fashion school who work a lot with um, digital printing. And so this sort of provides design inspiration for them and in looking at technique and how to make use of these technologies. And the 
digital printing actually occurs in this um, Comme des Garçons piece that we have as well, which is from fall 2005. And it's one piece that we actually purchased for the collection. Um, so we do have a, um, some budget for um, acquisitions to purchase. Um, and so the things that we really are concentrating on, on adding to our collection are these more contemporary um, pieces. Um, and this piece is really interesting. It, it, looks, it looks kind of like there's a dress or a suit, but really this bottom part that's the skirt is really just kind of like an apron that sort of wraps around and is open up the center back. Um, so I think if you were actually going to wear this piece, you would have to wear something underneath because there's nothing um, in the back. Um, but it, for the mannequin, I realized that, you know, it's facing the wall, the, the back is facing the wall, you don't see what's going on, it's very complicated looking, you don't realize that she's not wearing any under things. Um, so that's her, um, her little secret is that she's kind of exposed. But what's interesting, and you can't, it, it's a little hard to see what's going on in the picture. It's kind of hard to see even when you're, when you're looking at it, unless you look really closely. But it looks like fabric, it looks like these ruffles, but really that's printed on. So it's just this flat panel of, of silk, and it's been printed with the look of, of sort of draped fabric. And then the other piece that's next to it is from is by Yoli Tang, who is um, a designer, and she's based in New York, I believe, but she's originally Malaysian, um, of M Malaysian descent, um, but she is active in the United States. Um, and she, it, this is just such a wonderful geometric piece that she's taken these circles, big um, sort of concentric circles, these discs, and has shaped this dress out of it. And the top is really remarkable. It's just this flat, like, round of fabric that ties at the center front and then ties at the center back um, with these straps. Um, and that's sort of what's holding it on. And it's kind of like this weird disc that's very open on the sides. So we did some research to look at images of this piece um, on the runway. And it's also in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So we um, did some investigation to figure out what is going on with all of these um, straps. And oh, I'm getting a phone call, of course, <laughs> on my knock. Um, and so, um, um, so she, um, so we had to do some research to figure out how it, it looks because it was a little funny in our first go round. Um, but it is really this remarkable sort of feat of engineering. Um, and then the next section that we have, we have a lot of pieces that we've actually acquired in the past few years, which are um, from, from various parts of Asia or draw inspiration from Asian, from Asian textiles and designs. Um, and so um, this sort of holds together the next sort of section of the, of the pieces in the exhibition, but I'm only gonna show you a couple of these pieces. Um, one is this um, coat that's made out of that sort of repurposed paisley shawl. We have a few pieces in our collection which are paisley shawls, um, and this is just one of them. Um, and it was, it looks to have been made in the 1920s. It's sort of this cocoon style coat. And, um, and so, and one thing that's really interesting about it, and you can actually see it from this detail, and you can see a little bit when you look at the whole thing, that it has these sort of stripes on it that looks like it hasn't faded. And so it must have before, sometime between being a shawl and being a coat, it must have had strips of fabric um, either stitched onto it or it was sitting on a sofa or something and it had something laying on top of it and it kept you from fading in these pieces. So you can really see these interesting stories um, in, in the past of pieces and this. So this is a really great example of this sort of upcycling. We think of this as being a very new um, sustainability movement, but repurposing valuable textiles was something that has a really long legacy and things like paisley shawls were incredibly valuable and so they would have been reused over time. And so this is um, one, one of the examples of this that we have in our collection. And this is another gift from, from Helen Borowitz, um, who has a number of sort of 20s things that she had collected. 
Um, and then this other piece um, is American and it's by Oscar de la Renta. Um, but the style of embroidery and the sort of the overall aesthetic of it clearly draws from various Asian influences, either Indian or maybe Turkish or something, but it has this kind of Eastern inspiration to it. And the whole thing, this whole pattern jacket is all of this really elaborate embroidery and it is it's absolutely stunning and it has these sort of silk charmeuse trousers underneath it um and that oh, excuse me, i keep um, jumping around and um and then it has this net um blouse um uh, underneath it that's this sheer blouse um that it has these tiny pin tucks in it it's really this exquisite work of um craftsmanship um sort of the 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 work that went in to this outfit is really extraordinary. And then the next, the next sort of section that we have um, is of menswear. And menswear is another aspect of our collection that we're very interested in expanding. Um, I, um, we did a quick sort of survey of our collection just by searching our database. And it turned out that um, we had something like 10% of our clothes are, are menswear. And so you figure that men are 50% or so of the population. So they're grossly underrepresented. And I actually think 10% might be generous to how much of our, of our collection is menswear. Um, so it really is underrepresented in the collection. And this particular example actually ties together the previous section, which had a lot of Asian, Asian influence and Asian um, pieces with, um, with with menswear. And so this is an example of a hanbok, which is the traditional Korean clothing um, that um, we were donated. And it was from a, um, a, a professor um, here, a philosophy professor at the university who had passed away. And he had, he had received this, I guess, my recollection is that he received it as a gift when he visited Korea at some point. Um, so this was his his own um, handbook. And the thing that's really notable, and you can see from the, the way I've arranged the pictures, is that it has a lot of layers. And so each of these layers, um, we originally dressed it, my um, student assistant Carolyn and I put this all together and we wound up with this final look with the black coat over it. And it was a shame because it has all these glorious fabrics and all these great colors and this really interesting combination in these layers and you put the jacket over it and you can't see any of it. So we decided in our final presentation to take the black coat off of it and show it like this um, in the third image um, with this with this sort of orange gold jacket. Um, it, and um, and then to hang the coat separately behind it. So you see the layer, you get a sense of the layers to it, but you can also see all the pieces that are underneath and some of the fabrics and um, how it's layered, which is really um, the wonderful thing about this piece. It was quite, um, it was quite an adventure to get this on the mannequin. Um, the pants are actually really interesting too. There's a tie that, um, that functions as a belt, and then you roll the top of the pants over the belt, um, and then the the pant legs you um, are really wide, and you you sort of wrap them around the ankle, and then have a tie, and then sort of blouse the end of the um, the bottom of the pants over the ankle, so you don't see that. And sort of there's there's also in the in the traditional outfit there's also these sort of socks that go over over it so you so that sort of finishes it but we didn't have that we <laughs> once we had managed to dress this outfit we wound up with several pieces left over there were there are various scarves and um, replacement collars and other ties um, and so it felt a little bit like when you get a desk from Ikea and you assemble it and you find this pile of screws and stuff that are left over that you didn't quite find a place for but um, we we um, I'm fairly confident that this is um, this is correct. It's not. There's more pieces than you see here, but um, this is a accurate representation of, of what this would look like. Um, and then we have more menswear in the collection. Um, we have a piece. Um, um, we had received a donation um, when I first started from um, the, the Payne Fund, which was from the Payne Bolton family, um, which is a very prominent Cleveland family. Um, and this coat, for instance, belonged to 
Chester C. Bolton, I believe, um, who was the husband of Francis Payne Bolton. And he served in World War I. And so this was his coat when he served in World War I. And it is really stunning. Um, it has this amazing braid work on the sleeves. Um, and the whole thing, it weighs a ton. It's very heavy. It's entirely quilted inside has these, these sort of pockets that you can see on the detail image, but it's not really a pocket. It's just an opening in the coat so you could stick your hand through and, and access the pocket that you had in your pants or your jacket underneath it. Um, it's, it's sort of a slit through this outer, outer piece. It is really just amazing tailoring details. And then also um, with amazing tailoring details is this suit by um, Vivian Westwood. And um, so this is a, a contemporary piece of menswear. And the, then um, it looks like it, there are these two kind of discordant um, fabrics. So you have the jacket and the pants, but it's actually made out of exactly the same fabric. Um, it's just the face and the reverse of it. So one side of the fabric is this tan. And then if you sort of flip it, the fabric over the inside of the fabric is this really bold, stripy, paisley fabric. So, um, so the inside of the men's jacket, which I believe is not lined, you can see this fabric. And then um, sort of if you say rolled the pant cuff up, you'd see you'd see that same fabric. So it is all made out of the same, same fabric. Um, it's just a really great use of um, a fabric and a great fabric. Um, and then um, sort of the next portion of the exhibition, we have a lot of examples of knitwear. Um, for some reason, we have collected a number of pieces of knitwear over the years. Um, and one of the things that that's very relevant is that we have the great knitting um, technology at the fashion school in the textile lab. And so you can see the, um, see the sort of some, um, design options in terms of ways that knitting is used in the pieces that we have. Um, so these are just two of the examples of the knitwear that we have. Um, we have this great um, outfit from Rick Owens, which was a fairly recent um, addition to our collection back in 2018. Um, and it has this, this elaborate um, asymmetrical draped um, sweater. Um, and then it's paired here with, with a pair of, of um, wool trousers, which are also um, Rick Owens. Um, and then this other piece, the white one, is a is an outfit from the 1930s. Um, and so you can see this really great example of, of 1930s uh, knitwear. And the thing that's so great about these 30s suits and 20s suits and stuff is they just have these really great details to them. Um, you can see sort of faintly on here, they have these pockets that are this kind of chevron shaped, um, V shaped pockets. And then you see this great buckle on the belt. It, um, and I don't know whether it's some sort of early plastic, like a Bakelite kind of a plastic. Um, it seems to have cracked a little bit, but it's this really great um, chunky, chunky plastic. Um, and so it's this really great example of a knit ensemble. Um, so you see a little bit in this section on um, the different um, knit examples of knit over over the years. Um, and then this section leads into the next section in our exhibition where we showcase some African-American designers. Um, we have this Patrick Kelly dress, which is also knit. Um, but it, um, it really speaks to a section of our collection or one of our um, collection, our collecting um, commitments that we have going forward that we really want to represent greater diversity. Um, and we want to represent both African-American designers and also um, um, designs that or you know clothing that belonged to African-Americans and then represents you know, different, um, different more diverse more diverse population. And so we have these um, really great examples. Um, this Patrick Kelly was actually a purchase that we made this year. So you can see the um, the accession number is 2021. So this is a very recent um, um, piece that we got um, that we really we really committed to this over the summer um, with the events that have been going on lately. You know, it's, it's something that the Kent State University Museum has been dedicated to for years. Um, we've done exhibitions of um, the Southern, Southern African um, exhibition, for instance, we um, 
So it's not something that we sort of are coming to just because it's the fashionable thing to do right now, but we really have made a renewed commitment to this. Um, and so we have this piece by Patrick Kelly, who is a really um, renowned African-American designer who was actually worked in um, Paris. He was, I think he was based in Paris for much of his career, um, but he, he, he had these really fun, um, fun colors and bright colors. And his work is not only in the, um, the recent acquisitions, uh, the new, what's new exhibition, but there's also a piece by him that I believe is in um, Fashion Timeline. I could be wrong because things swap out in Fashion Timeline, but we have, a, we have a suit by him in Fashion Timeline and we also have a Stephen Burroughs um, dress in Fashion Timeline as well. Um, and then also Tracy Reese is another um, designer of color that we um, are really happy to have represented in the show. She has this, this sort of metallic shimmering coat, which um, unfortunately has a little bit of wrinkling um, on it. And I, and I, we did some checking and it, it's an absolutely do not uh, steam sort of a, a number. So, um, so we are trying to care for this as well as we can. Um, so it is there um, in all its shimmering glory in the exhibition. And the coat, her coat leads into the next section of the exhibition, which are sort of coats and suits and jackets. Um, so we have a number of really great examples of suiting um, and um, particularly these two, um, one is, coat and the other is a suit of these two gray wool pieces. Um, and the gray wool coat, which came in, I mean, I see the accession number is 2014, but I really vividly remember receiving this from the donor um, and it had belonged to her mother and her mother was born in um, Ukraine and, um, and had left Ukraine um, as a refugee and first settled in Germany, but that was around the time of World War II. And I think she ultimately had to flee Germany and wound up in England. Um, she lived in a refugee camp. Um, she worked in a cotton mill for several years. Um, she finally saved up money and was able to buy this coat from a, from a tailor. And it's this exquisite piece of tailoring. Um, it's really beautiful and has these great details on the back. But um, this coat, you know, the, the story of, of um, the donor's mother was, was um, you know, was really gripping. And also um, she was so moved to have this coat, you know, accepted into the museum that she became really emotional and it really struck me and this is it's always stayed with me this this like you know receiving this from her um because i really realized how tightly bound up people's clothes are with um with the people and like the the sort of the embodiment that that clothes represent because your clothes are sort of an extension of your person and um and so having this coat was really like this memory that she had of her mother and having you know the opportunity for this to be preserved and to, you know, to find a home and to find sort of another purpose it was very deeply meaningful for her in a way that I really will never forget. Um, and, and so this is sort of juxtaposed here against this suit, which is an Irene suit, which, um, and I don't, um, I don't actually remember this, the story of the, um, the stu suit and like who owned it or any of that. Um, but it's really, you know, valuable piece in our collection in that it's associated with the designer and that it has the connection with Irene, who is a really important American designer um, who worked um, in fashion design and moved, I mean, costume design and moved into, into fashion design and has just these, was just a wonderful, like, designer in the 40s and 50s and has these wonderful suiting details. You can see the sort of the layering of the lapels um, and the way the pockets are cut. Um, so really the contribution of a piece like this to our collection is so much because of its design innovation and the importance of its designer and maker. Whereas the other piece has so much powerful story in terms of who owned it and what it meant to them. Um, but while it's also a stunning piece and, it, and it's beautiful in the exhibit. So both of them are sort of powerful pieces of design but they also have these stories that they tell. Um, and then um, and then on the back wall, as you go into the gallery, um, what you see at the, from the far end of the gallery are these two quilts. Um, and um, I think these may be the only quilts that we've added in our collection in the past in the past decade. Um, it's not it's not really an aspect of our collection that we actively usually look for. But this this first quilt with the little tiny squares um, and the sort of pinwheel triangles um, is actually from Ravenna. 
Um, it's a family that was um, that was in Ravenna and they've been there since the 19th century. And um, this piece was made, the textiles, you can see the like the beautiful prints that are represented. Um, they are just, they're just sort of this wonderful um, um, sampling of print technology and print um, design from the mid 19th century. Um, and so the date from it, from basing, from these textiles is as early as the 1840s, but um, the family lore um, sort of positions it as having been um, made over over many years, I think. And so I think it wasn't completed until the 1880s or so. Um, and so this is really a great piece with local connection and local, local story. Um, and then the other piece that we have is again, one of the very recent um, pieces that we accepted um, and it actually came um, um, over the sort of the course of the pandemic year last year, um, this was added to our collection, and it was made by um, Susanna Hunter, who um, she grew up. She was a child of um, sharecroppers in in Alabama, um, and she, you know, lived in a, this 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 house that had no heating, and so she had this pile of quilts that her grand her grandchildren sort of inherited, or they got. She moved into ultimately with her grandchildren, her grandson and his family and had this pile of quilts on her bed, the, all these like amazing quilts that she had handmade um, over the years. And this piece, one thing that you actually can't see about this piece, which is really wonderful, is that the back of it is flower sacks. And so they're printed with the sort of the labels on the flower sacks that they made use of the materials um, from, from these sacks and repurposed them as, as the the lining fabric of it. Um, and so these are just these wonderful, like it's just such a wonderful collection of different patterns and fabrics and, and such a sort of a free form piecing of it, which sort of contrasts interestingly with the very patterned and designed um, piece with the very regular shapes that are repeated from the, from the more, um, the, from the earlier, quilting style and so you see these sort of these traditions of this much more you know impressionistic much more um improvisational style of the of the um of the quilt from Alabama um so that's a really wonderful piece that we're really excited to have in our collection um and then and then those two pieces the two actual sort of quilts are are paired with these these two pieces which are clothing but incorporate sort of quilting techniques um, and the first one is the seminal outfit um, which has this interesting story that it came from this um, the the donor's mother received it from a friend of the family who is the um, a modern dancer um, so it has this sort of interesting um, Cleveland backstory but it is this traditional um, seminal technique of patchwork. And so you can see they have these strips of fabric. So there's like an orange strip and then a purple strip and then another orange strip and then a red strip. And then those are stitched together in a long and long stripes and then the stripes are cut into shorter segments and then um, reattached on a diagonal. Um, so you get these great um, these great sort of um, diagonal um, squares. And so that's the way and it's this sort of traditional um, seminal technique that's done on it. And so we have the matching the blouse. This is from the blouse and then the skirt has these ex these sort of inset strips. And so it's really a great example um, of design technique and ways of incorporating these traditional, you know, we think about you know, quilts and patchwork for quilts, but ways of incorporating patchwork into clothing. Um, and then um, we have another example, which is more of an applique style. Um, so it looks like it's just this camel coat. Um, and on the front, you see this applique F, which is for fake London, which is the brand of this. It's this sort of, um, this sort of um, brash, um, fairly recent um, label that I think seemed to, um, um, close shut down in, in around 2006 but there's there's rumors of it resurrecting and stuff but that was really sort of all the information we could find about the designer um, but you can see they tend to incorporate the union jack into all of the different designs and so you can see the back of the coat is the union jack um, uh, sort of appliqued and and um, patched together on the back of the jacket. So it really is a sort of subtle camel coat, but then you see it from the back, it's it's pieced together and that's really 
sort of brilliant and yet kind of subtle way. Um, and then the next section of the exhibition, um, we've already seen the, the adorable baby shoes, um, but we have a number of a few pieces, uh, examples of children's clothing. Um, and um, the, for instance, another piece from the Payne family um, that I had mentioned before. Um, and this, um, there, this piece is a girl's dress. There's another piece that's a little, this little plaid dress, and it's actually a boy's dress. Um, but this one has this wonderful sort of embroidery in these bold um, sort of red, white, and blue patterning of it. Um, and it's this really great um, and tiny dress. Um, and then this wonderful suit ensemble. It's these, it's, it looks like pants, but it's actually this kind of, um, of like snow snow pants, they sort of have a bib. They're like overalls, um, and it's sort of this one piece outfit underneath the coat, and then a matching hat. Um, and this belonged to Linda Martell, who donated it, and she was the um, the niece of James Galanos, and she also donated a couple of pieces. Uh, other dresses that were James Galanos pieces, um, including one piece that's in the lobby. Um, so as you come in, the pieces that are in the lobby, pieces that are in the niche, these two beautiful beaded dresses um, are our recent acquisitions, as are the two pieces that face you in the in the stairwell as you come up. There's um, there's a pair of beach pajamas from the 1930s, and then a, um, a divided skirt that's sort of really early pants from about 1900. There are these remarkable pair of sort of pants, um, about as early as you can imagine a pair of pants being. Um, and so those pieces are also recent acquisitions that have come to the collection in the past 10 years. Um, particularly the beach pajamas, which I think came in last year, if I recall correctly. Um, and then um, we have some really beautiful examples of, of lace. Um, we have had a number of, of donations that include lace, it's always stunning. Um, and then these two pieces work together really well. You see the sort of the, the you know, the ivory colored silk with the black lace on them. But what's interesting too here is you see how, how different the styles of lace are, even though you think, oh, they're just black lace, but this one um, is very thin and fine in the floral design. And then this one has these heavier, almost tape sort of patterns um, that are, that are pieced together in, in, the, in the skirt. Um, and the one on the left is actually by the designer Valentina, um, who was a Ukrainian born um, woman who came to the United States. Um, oh, I forget when. She, um, she came, I think, I mean, she was here by the 1930s. So she was active in the United States in the 30s and 40s. Um, and she was a designer who worked a lot with Catherine Hepburn. So we have a number of pieces of her designs that are associated with our Cap Catherine Hepburn collection. Um, but she also, um, we also received a donation from Cole Yohannan, who um, is a scholar who's done a lot of research on her and wrote a book about her. Um, and he had a lot of her sort of archival material. He had patterns and um, sort of twalls that she had made. Um, and so this is one of the pieces from his collection that he donated to us. And it had, um, and it, it was sort of unfinished the the waistband of the skirt the there's there's like five skirts that are going on here it's strangely complicated um and some of the skirts don't have their final waistbands so i'm not sure this dress was ever really finished or or else it was either finished and then taken apart subsequently um it's unclear what its story is um but it's this this jacket is really really stunning um, and the whole piece with the with the sort of contrast between the white silk and the and the lace is really stunning. And then this dress was um, was worn by the donor. The donor's mother um, had worn this to a ball at the Waldorf Astoria, I believe, um, and she had made it herself with lace that she had gotten from Belgium, um, and then a, and put it together into this dress. And so it really is this sort of showcase for this black lace. Um, and then um, one of the final sections of the exhibition is are these corsets, and these came from the McTeer collection, um, and um, 
and McTeer was a collector of um, of sort of Corsington under things and stuff. And you may remember the exhibition that we did several years ago called Undressed. And that um, exhibition was actually done soon after we received the gift from the McTeers. And um, this was a, um, and the exhibition folk showcased a, a good segment of the collection, but not all of it. And so there were a number of pieces that still had never been exhibited. And so three of those pieces are included in this exhibition, including this really remarkable um, um, corset from the 1820s. And, and you can see it's all done with cording um, and it doesn't have, it doesn't have a busk down the front, but there would have been like a wooden, um, piece like a wooden a strip of wood that you stick down the center front of it which we have replicated in this um, in the display with a piece of cardboard we did not stick wood in in it we didn't have well actually we do but we did not choose to use a piece of our wood in the in the dress and then these grommets at the back where it's laced um, are made of bone um, and so this represents the height of 1820s um, technology. Um, and it's contrasted here with an 1920s corset um, where you see, you've seen um, a few, um, there's evolution, you have these steel bones. This earlier piece doesn't have any boning in it. It would have just had the, the, um, the busk down the front, which would have been wood. Um, and, but, but this is, this is, we've gone past boning all the way to steel um, boning in this, in this piece and then elastic panels. Um, and then also what's kind of remarkable about this one um, is the zipper. So that's, it's, um, there's all sorts of things going on in this. It's a piece of um, very elaborate engineering from the 1920s. Um, and then, um, so the final pieces that we have to showcase are um, accessories. Um, so um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of Asian pieces that have come in the past few years, um, including um, a gift from Jenny Hutchings who had um, traveled extensively and lived, I believe in Japan for a while. Um, and she donated a number of sort of really interesting um, pieces that are Japanese. For instance, this hat, um, which is this sort of all weather hat um, that travelers would wear in Japan. And it sort of, it's like an umbrella hat. Um, and the inside of it, I don't have the, the image to show you, but it, it has this sort of metal piece that sits on the head and, and, and like lifts it up. So it's, um, you have to sort of come and see it in person. I can't really describe it, but it, it's kind of like an umbrella. <laughs> like it sits above your head um, and then has this sort of um, umbrella of straw um, that, keeps you dry. And, um, and then we also have this pair of wicker shoes, which are actually from China. Um, and these are, you know, these really remarkably woven, they're like baskets, but, but sort of clogs. Um, and then we also, along with these, there's a, um, there's another pair of like snow boots that are made out of straw um, that are Japanese. And there's a, a wood print um, that, that shows a woman um, wearing these sort of snow boots that are very similar to that. That's a Japanese, a Japanese woodprint, woodcut. Um, and then here we return to where we begin, began this journey with this pair of little pasta slash um, pie crust shoes. Um, and these were donated, they had belonged to the donor's uncle, I believe when he was, when he was a little baby in 1918. So he was born in 1918 and these were his first pair of shoes um, and they are absolutely adorable and they're, they're really <laughs> super tiny. Um, and then also this, um, this hat, this is one of Savannah Clark's hats. Um, she has a, or had a very remarkable collection of hats um, and this Christmas tree hat um, really takes the cake. Um, so that is, um, that concludes the talk here. There's just a couple of um, gallery views. So you can see, I didn't talk about every single piece in the collection. So you'll have to come and see it in person and see all of these wonderful pieces. Um, and then here you can see, for instance, the handbook and the way the, um, the coat is displayed behind it. Um, but so, and I welcome any questions that people may have now. I can switch off my um, screen share and bring people up and um, you guys can ask questions. Sarah, we have um, our first question in the chat from Chris. What was the chemical they applied to black garments in the 19th century 
and why was it applied? So I don't know exactly what chemical it is, but it was it was a metal salt. It was it was a like salt, some sort of um, metallic salts, and it was it was added for it's the mordant that allows it to be dyed. Um, so it served a double purpose of um, of of allowing the dye to adhere to the fabric, but it also um, weighted um, the silk. It made it heavier, and I think it probably made it a little stiffer. Um, and as silk was sold by weight at some stage in its processing, um, it sort of it it literally weighted the silk and sort of um, put a put a thumb on the scale there and made it more more. Um, lucrative to, to make it. So that was sort of the other purpose. And so it's called weighted silk um, because of the metal salts that were added to it. If, if I could, if I could uh, kind of add on to that question, do you find blue dyes from those eras change color over time because of the way the dye was made? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the early dyes um, you know, when they did it, they were experimenting with all these different new technologies and these synthetic dyes, and a lot of them were very fugitive. Um, so sometimes the, um, you know, like some, some of the colors will, will, like the purples, I think, change and become these weird taupe colors and stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? Sarah, there's a... Um... I mean, I think there's also, I was just thinking about materials. We didn't have really have any sequins, but there's a big difference between the gel sequins that were used in the twenties. Mm -hmm. And then later when they finally started using, they were really metal sequins, right? Um, well, the sequins originally like 18th century sequins, early sequins are metal. So they're okay. like wire that are like wrapped in a circle and then flattened. Okay. Um, have like kind of a little opening. So you see that up and, and I don't know how long they use metal sequins. I haven't done a survey of these things, but, um, and then you start to like the gelatin sequins are the twenties. Um, so you don't want to get those wet as we learned. <laughs> yes. It's, um, it's every conservators, I guess it's like their first mistake. It's, it's putting a 1920s dress with sequins in water and watch all the sequins disappear. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then I mean, now they're sort of weird plastics. Plastic, yeah. Thanks. Do you have a favorite in the show or some favorites? Or surprise, like you, they look, different to you once you install them on the mannequins? Yeah, the mannequin process is always, um, I mean, the one that's in, um, can I, I don't know if I can share it. The, 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 the Carolina Herrera piece was pretty great. Um, that green um, silk, I, it just, I didn't show it in the, the slides, but it's, um, it's the one I see from my, from my, my office when every time I go by the exhibit. Um, has this great, it's this great sort of evening dress that has these very day dress kinds of um, trimming. So it has this sort of the double top stitching like you see on um, jeans, um, but it's like a strapless evening dress of silk. So it's a really great sort of mixing of different styles. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of the pieces are things that I love, you know, that I decided to take. So right. met a certain criteria, although not every, you know, everything has sort of a, a story of how it winds its way into the collection. Um, so um, yeah, those baby shoes, for instance, they are really, they're a memorable one. Yeah. Oh, the, and the another, there's like a pair of brown silk 1930s shoes that I, every time I see it, like when I saw a picture, I was going through, I pulled up a report of all the pieces that we'd got, accepted in the past 10 years. And I sort of had forgotten about them, but I saw that picture. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to have those shoes in this exhibit because I just, I just love those shoes. They're like these art deco um, brown satin shoes with like little leather um, cut out around the, around the lacings. Gold. It's like, it's black and like and edged with gold. Yeah. yeah it's like gold. Yeah. yeah. They're beautiful. And they have like a little like 
gold spots on the brown or something. They're, yeah. They're I forgot about that. yeah, I didn't have, I forgot about that when I was putting my slideshow together. Yeah. Other questions? You excited to come see? All right, I would ask everyone to unmute so we can give Sarah a little round of applause for all her work and sharing. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Thank Sarah. you, Sarah. It's wonderful. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing everyone in the gallery soon. Mm.